Section 10. The Peculiar Treasure of Believers. God's promises are the peculiar treasure of believers. The substance of faith's heritage lies in them. All the promises of our covenant God are ours to have and to hold as our personal possession. By faith we receive and embrace them, and they constitute our true riches. We have certain most precious things in actual enjoyment at this present, but the capital of our wealth, the bulk of our estate, lies in the promise of our God. That which we have in hand is only the earnest penny of the immeasurable wage of grace which is to be paid to us in due time. The Lord graciously gives us even now all things necessary for this life and godliness, but his choicest blessings are held in reserve for time to come. Grace given to us from day to day is our spending money for traveling expenses on the road home, but it is not our estate. Providential supplies are rations on the march, but not the ultimate feast of love. We may miss these wayside meals, but we are bound for the supper of the Lamb. Thieves may rob us of our ready cash, but our peculiar treasure is hid with Christ in God, beyond all fear of loss. The hand which bled to make this treasure ours is keeping it for us. It is a great joy to have a full assurance of our interest in the promises. But this joyful feeling we may lose, and we may find it hard to get it again, and yet the eternal inheritance will be quite as truly ours. It is as though a man should have in his hand a fair copy of his title deeds, and should much delight himself in reading it, until some mischance his copy is stolen or mislaid. The loss of his writings is not the loss of his rights. His comfortable reading of the title deed is suspended, but his claim to the property is not shaken. The covenant promise is entailed upon every joint heir with Christ, and there is no such thing as the breaking of this entail. Many an event may tend to shake the believer's sense of security, but the promise is sure to all the seed. Our greatest possession lies not in any present comfort or confidence which we receive from the promise, but in the promise itself and in the glorious heritage which it secures to us. Our inheritance lies not on this side of Jordan. Our city of habitation is not within the borders of the present. We see it from afar, but we wait for its full enjoyment in that illustrious day when our covenant head shall be revealed in his glory and all his people with him. God's providence is our earthly pension, but God's promise is our heavenly heritage. Did it ever occur to you to inquire why the way of God's dealing with his chosen should be by promises? He could have bestowed his blessings at once, and without giving us notice of his intention. In this way, he would have obviated the necessity of a covenant concerning them. There was no necessity in the nature of things for this plan of promising. The Lord might have given us all the mercies we needed without pledging himself to do so. God, with all his great strength of will and firmness of purpose, could have secretly resolved in himself to do all that he does unto believers without having made them the confidants of his divine counsels. Many a decree hath he kept secret from the foundations of the world 
Why, then, hath he revealed his purposes of blessings? Why is it that his dealings with his people from the gate of Eden till now have been upon the footing of publicly expressed promises? Does not the question answer itself? In the first place, we could not have been believers if there had not been a promise in which to believe. If the system of salvation is to be by faith, a promise must be made upon which faith can exercise itself. The plan of salvation by faith is selected because it is most suitable to the principle of grace, and this involves the giving of promises that faith may have both food and foundation. Faith without a promise would be a foot without ground to stand upon. And such a faith, if faith it could be called, would be unworthy of the plan of grace. Faith being chosen as the great evangelical command, the promise becomes an essential part of the gospel dispensation. Moreover, it is a charming thought that our good God designedly gives us promises of good things, that we may enjoy them twice, first by faith and then by fruition. He gives twice by giving by promise, and we also receive twice in embracing the promise by faith. The time for the fulfillment of many a promise is not by and by, but by faith we realize the promise and the foreshadowing of the expected blessing fills our souls with the benefit long before it actually comes. We have an instance of this upon a large scale in Old Testament saints. The great promise of the seed in whom the nations should be blessed was the ground of faith the foundation of hope and the cause of salvation to thousands of believers before the Son of God actually appeared among men. Did not our Lord say, Abraham saw my day, he saw it and was glad. The great father of the faithful saw the day of Christ through the telescope of God's promise by the eye of faith. And though Abraham did not obtain the fulfillment of that promise, but fell asleep before the coming of the Lord, as did Isaac and Jacob, and many others of the saints, yet he had Christ to trust in, Christ to rejoice in, and Christ to love and serve. Before he was born in Bethlehem, or offered upon Calvary, Jesus was so seen of the faithful as to make them glad. The promise gave them a Savior before the Savior actually appeared. So it is with us at this time. By means of the promise we enter into possession of things not seen as yet. By anticipation we make the coming blessing present to us. Faith obliterates time, annihilates distance and brings future things at once into its possession the lord has not as yet given us to join the hallelujahs of heaven we have not yet passed through the gates of pearl nor have we trodden the streets of transparent gold but the promise of such felicity lights up the gloom of our affliction and yields us immediate foretastes of glory. We triumph by faith before our hands actually grasp the palm. We reign with Christ by faith before our heads are encircled with our unfading coronets. Many and many a time we have seen the dawn of heaven while we have beheld light breaking from the promise. When faith has been vigorous, we have climbed where Moses stood and gazed upon the land which flowed with milk and honey. And then, when Atheist has declared that there is no celestial city, we have answered, Did we not see it? 
from the delectable mountains we have seen even by means of the promise to make us quite sure of the glory which the lord hath prepared for them that love him and thus we have obtained our first draught of the promised bliss and found therein a surge pledged of our full and final enjoyment of it do you not think that the promise also is intended to lead us constantly away from the things that are seen onward and upward to the spiritual and the unseen the man who lives on the promise of god has risen into quite another atmosphere than that which oppresses us in these low-lying vales of daily life it is better says one to trust in the lord than to put confidence in men it is better to trust in the lord than to put confidence in princes and so indeed it is for it is more spiritual more noble more inspiring we need to be raised to this elevated trust by divine power for our soul naturally cleaveth unto the dust alas we are hampered by our idolatrous desire to see and touch and handle we trust our senses but have not sense enough to trust our god the same spirit which led israel to cry in the wilderness make us gods to go before us leads us to sigh for something tangible by flesh and blood whereon our confidence may take hold we hunger for proofs tokens and evidences and will not accept the divine promise as better and surer than all visible signs thus we pine away in hungering for tokens and evidences which are visible till we are invisible oh it is a blessed thing for a child of god to be made to quit the sand of things temporal for the rock of things eternal by being called upon to walk by the rule of the promise furthermore the promises are to our hearts a help to the realization of the lord himself the child of god when he believes the promise is brought to feel that god is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him our tendency is to get away from a real god we live and move in the region of materialism and we are apt to be enthralled by its influences we feel these bodies to be real when we have pain in them and this world to be real when we are weighted with its crosses yet the body is a poor tent and the world a mere bubble these visible things are unsubstantial but they appear sadly solid to us what we need is to know the invisible to be quite as real as that which is seen and even more so we need a living god in this dying world and we must have him truly near us or we shall fail the lord is training his people to perceive himself the promise is part of this educational process when the lord gives us faith and we rest on his promise then we are brought face to face with him we ask who gave this promise who is to fulfill this promise and our thoughts are thus led into the presence of the glorious jehovah we feel how necessary he is to the whole system of our spiritual life and how truly he enters into it so that in him we live and move and have our being if the promise cheers us it is only because there is god at the back of it for the mere words of the promise are nothing to us except as they come from the lips of god who cannot lie 
and accept as they are wrought out by that hand which cannot fail. The promise is the forecast of the divine purpose, the shadow of the coming blessing. In fact, it is the token of God's own nearness to us. We are cast upon God for the fulfillment of his engagements, and that is one of his reasons for dealing with us after the method of promise. Perhaps if the Lord had dropped our mercies at our door without a previous hint of their coming, we should not have cared to know whence they came. If he had sent them with unbroken regularity, even as he makes his sun to rise every morning, we might have slighted them as common results of natural laws, and so have forgotten God because of the punctuality of his providence. Certainly we should have lacked that grand test of the being and loving kindness of God, which we now receive as we read the promise, accept it by faith, plead it in prayer, and in due season see it fulfilled. That regularity of divine bounty, which ought to sustain and increase faith, is often the means of weakening it. He whose bread comes to him by a government annuity or a quarterly rent is tempted to forget that God has any hand in it. It ought not to be so, but through the hardness of our hearts such an ill result does frequently follow from the constancy of a gracious providence i should not wonder if those israelites who were born in the wilderness and had gathered manna every morning for years had also ceased to wonder at it or to see the hand of the lord in it shameful stupidity but, ah, how common! Many a person has lived from hand to mouth and seen the hand of the Lord in the gift of every morsel of bread. At last, by God's goodness, he has prospered in this world and obtained a regular income which he has received without care and trouble. And shortly he has come to look at it as the natural result of his own industry, and has no longer praised the loving-kindness of the Lord. To be living without the conscious presence of the Lord is a horrible state of affairs, supplied but not by God, sustained without the hand of God. It were better to be poor or sick or exiled, and thus to be driven to the approach of our Heavenly Father, to avoid our coming under the curse of forgetting God, the Lord is pleased to put his choicest blessings into connection with his own promises and to call forth our faith in reference to them. He will not allow his mercies to become veils to hide his face from the eyes of our love, but he makes them windows through which he looks upon us. The promiser is seen in the promise, and we watch to see his hand in the performance. Thus are we saved from that natural atheism which lurks within the heart of man. I think it well to repeat that we are put under the regime of promise in order that we may grow in faith. How could there be faith without a promise? How growing faith without grasping more and more of the promise? We are made to remember in the hour of need that God has said, Come upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee. Faith believes this word, calls upon God, and finds herself delivered. Thus she is strengthened and made to glorify the Lord. Sometimes faith does not find the promise fulfilled at the moment, but she has to wait a while. This is fine exercise for her, and serves to test her sincerity and force. 
This test brings assurance to the believer and fills him with comfort. By and by, the answer is given to prayer. The promised boon is bestowed. Faith is crowned with victory and glory is given to God. But meanwhile, the delay has produced the patience of hope and made every mercy to wear a double value. Promises afford training ground for faith. These are poles and leaping bars for the athletic exercise of our young faith, by the use of which it grows to be so strong that it can break through a troop or leap over a wall. When our confidence in God is firm, we laugh at impossibility and cry, It shall be done. But this could not be if there were not an infallible promise wherewith faith should gird itself. Those promises which as yet are unfulfilled are precious helps to our advance in the spiritual life. We are encouraged by exceeding great and precious promises to aspire to higher things. The prospect of good things to come strengthens us to endure and to press forward. You and I are like little children who are learning to walk and are induced to take step after step by an apple being held out to them. We are persuaded to try the trembling legs of our faith by the sight of a promise. Thus, we are drawn to go a step nearer to our God. The little one is very apt to cling to a chair. It is hard to get it to quit all hold and venture upon its feet. But at last, it becomes daring enough for a tiny trip, which it ends at its mother's knees. This little venture leads to another and another, till it runs alone. The apple plays a great part in the training of the babe. So does the promise in the education of faith. Promise after promise have we received, till now I trust we can give up crawling on the earth and clinging to the things which rest upon it, and can commit ourselves to the walk of faith. The promise is a needful instrument in the education of our souls, in all manner of spiritual graces and actions. How often have I said, My Lord, I have received much from thee. Blessed be thy name for it. But there is yet a promise more which I have not enjoyed. Therefore, I will go forward till I obtain its fulfillment. The future is an unknown country, but I enter it with thy promise and expect to find in it the same goodness and mercy which have followed me hitherto. Yea, I look for greater things than these. Nor must I forget to remind you that the promise is part of the economy of our spiritual condition here below because it excites prayer. What is prayer but the promise pleaded? A promise is, so to speak, the raw material of prayer. Prayer irrigates the fields of life with the waters which are stored up in the reservoirs of promise. The promise is the power of prayer. We go to God, and we say to him, Do as thou hast said, O Lord, here is thy word. We beseech thee, fulfill it. Thus the promise is the bow by which we shoot the arrows of supplication. I like, in my time of trouble, to find a promise which exactly fits my need, and then to put my finger on it, and say, Lord, this is thy word, I beseech thee to prove that it is so by carrying it out in my case. I believe that this is thine own writing, and I pray thee, make it good 
to my faith. I believe in plenary inspiration, and I humbly look to the Lord for a plenary fulfillment of every sentence that he has put on record. I delight to hold the Lord to the very words that he has used, and to expect him to do as he has said, because he has said it. It is a great thing to be driven by prayer, by necessity, but it is a better thing to be drawn to it by the expectation which the promise arouses. Should we pray at all if God did not find us an occasion for praying, and then encourage us with gracious promises of an answer? As it is in the order of providence, we are tried, and then we try the promises. We are brought to spiritual hunger, and then we are fed on the word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. By the system which the Lord follows with his chosen, we are kept in constant intercourse with him and are not allowed to forget our Heavenly Father. We are often at the throne of grace, blessing God for promises fulfilled and pleading promises on which we rely. We pay innumerable visits to the divine dwelling place because there is a promise to plead and a God waiting to be gracious. Is not this an order of things for which to be grateful? Ought we not to magnify the Lord that he doth not pour upon us showers of unpromised blessings, but he enhances the value of his benefits by making them the subjects of his promises and the objects of our faith? 